everybody for rejoining us. It is just great to have the two speakers we've got here today. I'm really excited to learn about environmental DNA. And so Paul Simon, Simonin from Cornell is where he's a postdoc research is joining us today. Uh, in addition to his work at Cornell, Paul is also teaching at Boston University. Uh, fortunately for us, he's a native New Yorker and uh, lived, he grew up near the Southwestern Adirondacks and is now working out of Ithaca. Paul had studied at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and University of Vermont and at Cornell and has worked in fisheries projects across New York and the Great Lakes. He's also done some pretty exciting work in the Caribbean and Indonesia and Africa and had a chance to travel. But we're really delighted that his work is now taking him into the world of eDNA. And I'm gonna introduce both of our speakers before I turn it over. That way I don't have to interrupt you guys as you give your presentation. But I'm also very thrilled that Mark Whitmore is joining us today as well. Mark is the founder and the principal investigator at the New York State Hemlock Initiative. And a super extra thank you to Mark because Mark is currently on the West Coast trapping predators for hemlock woolly adelgid. So it's pretty early in the morning, um, West Coast time. Mark is originally from the West Coast and he started his career studying enemies of spruce beetles in Alaska and then moved down to the lower 48 to study biological controls for pine bark beetles. And he has been at Cornell now since 1989. And we're so fortunate to have that expertise here in New York. And he's going to share some of the work that he's doing to use environmental DNA. Uh, Mark has also been leading the efforts for biocontrols on HWA, and we will talk about that, I'm sure, at future programs. So I think with no further ado, though, I'm going to turn it right over to you, Paul, and thanks again for joining us this morning. Sounds great. No, thanks so much for the invitation. And it's, it's really a privilege to join you all today. It looked like some interesting um, discussion earlier in the day, too, and um, I'm excited to chat with everyone. It sounds like we have some time for question and answer after the presentation, which will be great. Um, I'd say if there's any burning questions, feel free to, if we were in person, it's easier to be interactive, but feel free to jump in or put questions in the chat, too, um, and we can either chat about those while we're going along or afterward. So um, there we go. So I, I would like to start also, I'm going to give kind of an intro to eDNA and then aquatic invasive species um, detection using eDNA in particular. Um, a number of colleagues have worked with me over the last really couple of years as I've gotten into doing a little more eDNA work, um, and especially those in kind of our research team here at Cornell, which are David Lodge, Jose Andres, and then Luciana and Kara. And um, it's also um, very much worth mentioning some of the other prison networks, um, in particular the St. Lawrence, Eastern Lake Ontario, Finger Lakes, and Western New York prison networks were um, kind of interactions with them were some of the reasons that I got involved in eDNA, and uh, we're still having some projects ongoing. We've had some COVID-related delays to those, but it's been fun to collaborate with them um, on some harbor sampling and some new methods development that we're still working on. Um, so it's been exciting to work with all these individuals, and they, they are a big reason that I've learned more about eDNA myself. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to start with a little bit of a um, personal story. So I was a graduate student in 2007 working on Lake Champlain. And we had funding to study uh, this fish, which maybe some of you mentioned or recognize. If we were in person, I'd ask, ask who knows what it is. But it's a little out of scale here, but this is a smelt. And we had funding to study uh, rainbow smelt population dynamics in Lake Champlain, ideally prior to any increase in alewife presence in the lake. Alewife had been detected for four plus years earlier in one part of the basin, but weren't thought to be in necessarily the rest of the lake. We weren't sure if they were around yet. So we wanted to study smelt before they took off. So we planned these, these surveys, did lots of sampling using kind of traditional fisheries tools, trawling. Um, we put together plans to do this. And then we started doing some of this intensive sampling. Um, and we found a lot of alewife uh, present in many parts of the lake and in pretty high abundance. Um, so we were able to catch them in trawls um, and a number of other tools that we were then starting to use too. And um, all of a sudden, then we had to pivot this study and a lot of management action shifted a bit um, with alewife in the lake to, to focus on both species and what is the 
presence of ill life can do um, do in the lake for the management of, of other salmonids and, and sport fisheries. And I bring this up because um, a lot of our traditional sampling methods basically just weren't sensitive enough to tell us that ill life were already in a lot of parts of the lake when they were at lower abundance. We needed a tool that could tell us they were there, but just a few of them at that point, there weren't too many around. Um, and I don't necessarily bring up ill life to refer to them as invasive. I think there's, there's, they may or may not be harmful, so may or may not fall into that definition, but they're non-native and they were new in the lake and they were present throughout the lake, we now know at low abundance, but we weren't able to detect them until they, they really took off. Um, so I'm gonna to talk today about eDNA as a new tool for observation. Um, we needed a new method then, and um, obviously humans have been inventing new observation tools for thousands of years, um, and in aquatic systems in particular, there's kind of this constant evolution of techniques, partly because we just can't see underwater, of course. Um, and I'm not gonna address eDNA as kind of a silver bullet that can solve all our sampling um, challenges, but it is a powerful tool that has a lot of useful applications in certain scenarios. So the talk today, I'm gonna to split into kind of three main sections. The first being an intro to eDNA methods, give us a sense of how it works. The next kind of a focus on surveying for rare species, eDNA just kind of history and some of the advantages, why is it taken off so fast in popularity? And then finally, I'm gonna mention an aquatic invasive plant detection example, hydrilla, um, and just to introduce that it is possible uh, to detect plants using eDNA also. So to start with, what are we talking about with eDNA? Um, so a simple definition is that environmental DNA is DNA that's present in the environment, so that could be in the air, could be in the water, could be in soil, and can be extracted without isolating any specific type of organism beforehand. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of sampling methods obviously need to see the organism to know it's there. Um, and eDNA really, um, I'll get into this in a little more detail, but it really took off because we can think about it pretty simply, like your, your likelihood of detecting something is generally related to how many of them there are out there. So if there's one plant out there, you're got a certain chance of seeing it. Well, with environmental DNA, these organisms, whatever they are, are giving off bits of tissue all the time. And so it's almost certain that there are more bits of tissue per organism out there than there are individual organisms, right? So these plants in here are probably, they're probably not just giving off one individual little bit of tissue. And so our, our probability, if we can do the sampling right, of detecting bits of tissue, bits of DNA from these organisms is gonna generally be higher than detecting just that one individual plant. Again, if we can do the sampling correctly. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the methods work just to um, get us into some of the details specifically. And then I'll zoom back out and talk about some of the pros and cons. I'm gonna mostly talk about aquatic species, um, but obviously this applies to terrestrial also. Aquatic is a little bit more my, my background and expertise area. So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but these five steps I'm going to step through as kind of our methods overview. So for aquatic invasive species detection, and you can think about this with soil or air also, the first is really to collect the sample. Um, and the amount can vary widely depending on kind of the system. About a liter of water is probably about a median kind of quantity that is often sampled. For our harbors project and with some of the other prisms, we've collected 250 milliliters per sample. Um, and that can change for a variety of reasons. Next step is to filter that sample. Um, so again, a variety of methods are used. You can attach it to a net, use a syringe, or just pressurize the sample in some way. About a filter size of one micron is pretty common. Um, that can vary also. But most of the DNA is sampled in cells or clumps of cells. It's not just free floating in tiny little bits um, all by itself. So you're pulling out little bits of tissue basically. Next piece is to extract all the DNA. By extract, we basically mean kind of clean away all the other stuff in the sample, the other tissue, the other biological or, or inorganic material in the sample and isolate the DNA all by itself. So it's, it's generally quite a few chemistry sort of steps to do this extraction. Next step is, is pretty much making a lot of additional copies of whatever DNA is in the sample. 
So at this stage, you can decide to make copies of all the DNA, ideally, or all of the plants or all the fish, um, or can focus on one or a, a, a few species at a time. Generally done, um, I'm sure we have some people with quite a bit of background on this um, call in ecology, biology, and you might recognize um, some of the terminology here. PCR machines, polymerase chain reaction procedures are generally what we use to amplify DNA. And that can um, happen in a generally pretty simple PCR. We can do it in a quantitative way that counts the number of copies made or some more modern, they're all pretty modern, but the, the latest technology, digital, digital graph of PCR also. And then the final step is basically visualizing the presence of the DNA. So all these other steps obviously happen before we really know whether there's anything that we're interested in actually in the sample. Um, so this is a stage where we see whether anything was in there. And the most simple way to do that is by using a gel, electrophoresis, that just draws the DNA across this gel and we can visualize it, light it up um, on the gel. You can also use digital readouts um, that come along with the PCR process, um, or we can sequence whatever DNA is in the sample and that would return um, a lot of basically text files of genetic code that we can then match up with databases of species ID. Just to, to mention a little bit more about that meta barcoding step, um, they're basically building on the technology that we now have with next generation sequencing, which I won't get into all the details of, um, but we have the ability to, to determine the genetic sequence of lots of um, specimens, lots of samples all at once. Um, and this is obviously technology that is constantly improving and I'm not a geneticist by background to know all the details, even of how it works. But they're based on um, taking advantage of the massive amount of genetic data that we can produce using these techniques. And then again, matching those sequences with databases of known um, organisms. So we can talk in a little more detail about some of the pros and cons of different analysis steps um, as we move along a little bit here. Um, a couple pieces worth mentioning that are just kind of notes along the way. Obviously, the more sensitive the assay, the greater the risk for false positives from contamination of any um, steps along the way. That could be in the field, it could be in the lab. Related to the lab, um, we in our procedures in our lab space here at Cornell have separate rooms for some of the analyses to take place in to separate, um, again, the contamination, reduce the risk of contamination. Um, but also in the field, you can imagine that moving your, um, we're again looking at little tiny pieces of tissue, so moving your kayak from one area into a new area and sapling water, especially say it's raining and you have dust and pollen and maybe other tissue running off of materials, you have to be careful to not pick up this material coming off a boat, say, um, and also off of hands. So you'll see in some of these images, we have gloves on, and that's kind of a standard procedure too and also a standard procedure to change the gloves and between samples and between sampling sites. So this, um, you might be able to imagine, has some implications and I'm, I'm not gonna dive into a lot of the details, I think, of citizen science opportunities and pros and cons. Um, the contamination risk is really something to keep in mind. Um, and there are a lot of citizen science opportunities. There's a lot of challenges also. Um, a lot of the setup of the sampling materials before distributing to people doing the monitoring is a key part. So sterilizing all the bottles, all the filters that are going to be used is important. But then in the field too, there's certain, again, standard techniques that can be implemented and need to be followed to reduce the contamination risk. So we can return, like I mentioned, to some of these details with the analysis methods in um, a little bit if we have some time to do so. I'm going to step now though through some um, background for just some of the history of eDNA and kind of why it became so popular. So the first study using environmental DNA um, in this particular way took place um, in France um, from a team that was interested in detecting American bullfrog in ponds. And this study was in, uh, published in about 2008. 
So again, not super long ago, and um, really kind of launched this environmental DNA field, especially for invasive species use. Since that time, the number of research studies and applications have really increased kind of exponentially. Um, don't need to read all the titles on here, but if we uh, look at a recent analysis a couple of years ago now that kind of studied the increase in eDNA use, we can see that there's um, really a variety of types of research questions that are being addressed now with eDNA. So just to look at some of the ones that are listed on this slide. So starting in 2011, um, some of our team was involved in the initial use of eDNA for Asian carp detection in the Great Lakes. And there was interest on that front. But since then, um, some of these are more biodiversity focused studies. So marine and freshwater uh, biodiversity in various places. Um, let's see, freshwater eukaryote diversity from metabarcoding. Um, and really an, an increase in some of these techniques that allow us to determine the biodiversity of samples using metabarcoding. There's a conservation of fisheries example in this one. Um, let's see aquatic invertebrates, kind of the ecology of eDNA. So a variety of, of research questions that have kind of both validated the method and applied it to other types of ecological um, research, biodiversity management, so kind of conservation biology, and also invasive species detection. We think about the types of organisms being studied. Um, the highest bars on this list are fish, invertebrates, microorganisms, and then also amphibians. Um, if we look at this top figure, we can also see that um, it's kind of divided between uh, studies and, and uses that focus on invasive species, which is this darkest section. Now, the text is a little bit smaller here, so you don't have to read all the details of it, but it's darkest one is invasive species, and then kind of common species are this tan color, and the um, lightest color is just rare or possibly threatened or endangered species. So again, in this case, most studies have been focused on fish and kind of spread evenly, but a lot of invasive species focus um, on fish and then also invertebrates and other organisms. So pretty wide spread. So why has it taken off quite so quickly and what are the advantages that have really encouraged uptake? So to start with, it's non-destructive. So as you can imagine, and you all have experience with, um, a lot of survey methods are destructive in some way. Um, so if it's an invasive species context, that may or may not be a problem, but also to use kind of fisheries terminology, there's also a lot of bycatch or destruction of species organisms that you aren't necessarily interested in, in herding during the process of sampling. So a big, and especially again, kind of thinking through some of the other ways eDNA is used, Sampling for endangered or threatened species in a non-destructive way can be particularly advantageous. As a side note, this is this is really both a pro and a con. Um, but a lot of eDNA type sampling requires quite a bit less permitting because it's not destructive, um, which makes some of the sampling simpler. It also means that sometimes it's trickier for state and federal agencies to keep track of the type of research that's happening because that permitting system isn't required. Another advantage is that it's highly sensitive. So I hinted at this a little bit earlier and you probably are aware of this, just maybe hearing about eDNA. Um, if we think about how to visualize this, we can um, think about high density populations. So this would be like the, um, the alewife in my earlier example, or a real dense population of hydrilla versus low density populations. And we kind of plot those in terms of effort and detection probability. So if there's a lot of an organism out there, we don't need a lot of effort to detect it. And there's a pretty um, uh, low cost associated with using that. So in this case, um, for a high density population, low amount of effort needed and a pretty good chance we're going to detect it. In these types of scenarios, really traditional field sampling methods are more cost effective. This is just kind of a theoretical figure. This line in between the methods is may or may not be exactly here, but basically at lower density populations, we would need a lot of effort to detect them using traditional field sampling methods. And in this general zone, 
eDNA methods are more cost effective. So these say Asian carp, they're kind of famous <laughs> actually for just jumping into the boat if you're driving by with a, a motor on um, when they're very abundant. If they're that abundant, you don't need eDNA basically. But if there's just a couple of them in the Chicago Canal, it's more likely that an eDNA type sampling method would be a feasible way to detect them before they're going to be so abundant um, that they're able to be seen using other methods. So highly sensitive. Another advantage um, is that you can do multi-species detection using the same survey. So this is what I was hinting at with some of the biodiversity metrics and um, already discussed this somewhat, but using the unique genes um, in particular, um, cytochrome oxidase one, we'll talk about some of the genes that are commonly used in plant work in the future that are common throughout all organisms, but also highly variable between organisms. We can detect a variety of species using a single sample. Another advantage, reduce need for taxon specific field training. And so this is one that um, it's worth saying up front, this doesn't necessarily mean we don't need taxonomic expertise. Experts are very much needed and taxonomists are still very much needed, maybe even more crucial because we need to rely heavily on accurate databases that match the taxonomy knowledge with genetic information. So we still need good taxonomists, but for broad scale sampling, especially of organisms that may be tricky to identify in the field, a reduction in the need for that high um, level of training is a big advantage in some types of surveys. And this also goes for um, settings where the organisms are very small and you might need a microscope or other specialized tools to be able to detect them in the field, plankton, algae, small organisms such as that. So these are just a few advantages of eDNA-based surveillance. And as we think about those advantages, we can then start to envision some of the uh, potential applications. So I've mentioned species that are rare. That could be species that are rare because they're early in the invasion process, or they could be threatened or endangered species in a particular area that we're interested in detecting. Second potential application is species that are difficult to sample with traditional tools. Um, that could include, like I mentioned, plankton, algae, um, which are not able to be surveyed on a, um, in a simple way, especially by untrained uh, groups. Species for which handling causes harm. Again, I can envision some of this. There's been eDNA work. Again, sometimes it's with endangered species, but also even common species for which handling is, is detrimental in some sort of way. Fourth point, habitats in which traditional tools are difficult to deploy. Um, so that could, again, be for a variety of methods. You can envision aquatic environments where it's difficult to, um, to sample, to use a variety of tools. Um, sampling strong currents, seasonality challenges also, um, whether it's through the ice, using different types of methods, um, can envision a variety of reasons. It might be tricky to use a more traditional method. And then a final point is where integrative samples are cost effective. And so there've been some interesting studies done using eDNA on a watershed type of level to sample the types of biodiversity that are present upstream. Um, and again, with a lot of these points, it's helpful. I'm sure many of you have a strong ecology background like myself. And it's helpful to really think about the ecology of the eDNA, so its presence in the system, its abundance, its distribution. And you can imagine then, especially if there's flowing water or a strong wind coming from a certain direction, the ways in which um, these particles of tissue can be then distributed in their abundance in certain areas. And we can really take advantage of that if we're interested in that type of survey. So if we think a little bit about invasive species applications, it's helpful to think about um, the invasion process. So the most effective, as I'm sure you all know, point in the invasion process to manage in terms of economic costs and um, 
effectiveness in terms of ecological impacts is to prevent introduction. The next stage in the process is when an organism is becoming to be uh, beginning to be established, but is at a very low abundance. And it's really at that point where a tool such as EDMA that's very sensitive um, has been most commonly used and is, is advantageous. So if we think about a detection that happens at that point, um, I think it's important to mention a couple uh, pieces related to what that can mean. So if we're working in an area and interested in detecting whatever the species may be, obviously a positive detection can be very influential for management groups, um, for a variety of stakeholders. And so it's important to communicate actively and openly before that detection happens and put together a plan for how results will be shared. Um, and the PRISM network is a great example of how partnerships can develop and how these relationships can be built. And it's important, again, if it's, especially if it's an influential detection, to so have a plan for who will be notified, when, in what order, et cetera. You can envision this, um, the challenges. And I guess it's worth saying too, as a final point, um, for any of the group here that's interested in kind of the science and publishing side of things, the sharing of results um, in this type of way doesn't negate the possibility to publish a journal article or whatever about it in the future. Um, and there's a way to, to put together these types of plans that are um, useful for all parties involved. So if we think about um, using eDNA and if we detect something, how should it be interpreted um, with implications for management? So we have, again, a variety of different types of detections that can happen with eDNA. Let's say we have just a few limited number of eDNA detections, and it's a surprise. We don't really know of any way this organism could have gotten here. That's kind of at one end of the spectrum here. The other end, say we have a lot of eDNA detections, multiple samples um, in the same area, and there's a known invasion pathway, and maybe there's a historical capture record of some type of organism in the basin. That's kind of the other end of our spectrum. And if we kind of plot that against the likelihood of secondary spread, we can start to think about what the implications may be for management of a particular species. So if there's strong eDNA evidence and a historical capture record, and there's a likelihood of secondary spread, the response options would probably be to quickly move to contain or delimit, somehow control or eradicate the species where possible. The other end, other end of the spectrum, obviously, if there's little likelihood of secondary spread and pretty weak evidence, the response should really be to confirm the presence using other detection methods and dig more into it in that way. And obviously, we can think about any other points on this spectrum and what the useful management implications would be in those types of scenarios. And it's really some of these in-between points where it's challenging to balance some of the potential risk to action versus the need to confirm uh, presence prior to action. So a little bit of history and a little bit of the advantages and pros and cons of using eDNA. The final section I'm going to address here, and we can return to some of these topics um, half an hour or so, I suppose, question and answer time as much as we'd like to dig into them in more detail. But I'd like to mention a, an example using eDNA to detect aquatic invasive plants, and hydrilla in particular. So if you were really tuned in and, and maybe have very good vision <laughs> and can read the axes on this plot, you may have noticed that there's a variety of taxonomic groups surveyed, but that aquatic invasive plants is actually a zero on this lower figure. Well, um, I have some good news, which is that it works for plants too. <laughs> And I'm gonna close with just a couple of examples, um, like I mentioned with hydrilla. So when this study was done, there weren't many examples of aquatic plant detection using eDNA. But since then, there've been a few different examples published. Um, this was one in, I guess it's 2015, and then um, subsequent ones have, have followed. So I, I've hinted at this a little bit, but um, using eDNA, we focus on a particular either gene or suite of genes that are common in a variety of organisms. 
So if we think about plants, um, some, some have carryover obviously between genes that are present in animals also, but there's three main genes that have been used and then a fourth potentially for detections of, of plants and aquatic plants in particular. These are these abbreviated in this way in particular, you don't need to remember these, but these top three genes are present in chloroplasts and the ITS1 gene is present in the nucleus. Um, and I point that out because kind of two main reasons. For one, in, or in animals, there's a similar type of breakdown where we sample mitochondrial genes or nuclear genes. And it's a similar situation in plant cells versus animal cells, where there's more mitochondria in an animal cell, there's multiple mitochondria for only one nucleus. And in plant cells, there's multiple chloroplasts for only one nucleus. And so these chloroplast genes or the mitochondria genes are gonna be more abundant than the nuclear genes. So these are the three main genes that are the focus of, um, of plant surveys using chloroplasts. These were the focus, along with several other genes, of a survey um, testing our ability to detect hydrilla. So I'm sure you all know about hydrilla. I won't go into too much detail other than to say there are two biotypes you might remember. Um, a monoecious form, which has both male and female flowers on the same plant, and a dioecious form, which has the male and female flowers on separate plants. And so some of our group, I wasn't involved in this particular study, but a few years ago, some of the team based at Notre Dame at that point, um, did a hydrilla field study with two main goals. One was to defect, detect or test the efficiency of eDNA to detect both biotypes. And the second goal was to determine if there's a difference between field sensitivity or in-field sensitivity between different parts of the genome. So nuclear genes versus chloroplast genes to try and perfect the method for plants and hydrilla detection in particular. So the team sampled in a variety of places where hydrilla is present, um, Maryland and Ohio, Ohio River Valley, and also in Texas, and then sampled some lakes that did not have hydrilla, so mostly out west, a number of California lakes, also Lake Tahoe and another lake in Nevada. What did they find? So with this first goal, testing the efficacy of eDNA for both biotypes, it worked. <laughs> and there actually was not a, a big difference or a significant difference in detecting eDNA of the monoecious or dioecious form um, throughout the area that was surveyed. With the second goal, is there a difference between nuclear versus chloroplast genes and the sensitivity? Nuclear genes actually unexpectedly were, there we go, were more sensitive. So detections were made using both genes and, and associated genetic primers for, that are coming from both chloroplast and nuclear genes, but the nuclear genes were more sensitive in the analyses that were conducted, which was a bit of a surprise. The only caveat is that the nuclear genes they were using in this particular study were shorter than the ones in the chloroplast. And again, this can get technical pretty fast and I won't go into all those details unless we want to, but the, the smaller, sam the smaller um, fragment size may have been a factor that confounded some of the tests between chloroplast and nuclear presence. So like a lot of things, there's probably a little bit more further study needed to determine that difference. But the, the take home message really is that it worked for genes in both um, chloroplast and nuclei, which was important. Um, another result worth mentioning is that there were few eDNA detections when plants were not also visible. That could mean that they were not present when they weren't visible, or it, and it could mean that sensitivity is pretty low and they were not visible, they were deeper, and the genetic material just wasn't getting to the area that was being sampled. And so this is where we get into the question of whether, okay, so if you can see them, maybe you don't need to do an eDNA survey also. And some of these pros and cons need to be discussed when thinking about whether eDNA is the right tool. In a lot of the sample sites in this particular study, 
it probably would have been more cost effective to do a visual survey. But there were, I think, a couple sites where they detected hydrilla using eDNA and did not see them. So again, it's depending on that process of invasion and whether there's a high density present or not, and also potentially seasonality. So I won't go into too much more detail, but there's more detail um, in this publication, which I'm happy to share around to you from, I guess, two or three years ago now. And a final piece I'll mention with Hydrilla that our team is working on at the moment, um, real quickly, is a color detection assay, which is, is pretty cool. And in short, we're trying to figure out ways to put together a procedure whereby the sample would change color if hydrilla DNA were present. So this was a quick trial we did a little while ago, I guess pre-COVID a little bit, where these yellow samples have hydrilla in them, and then there's decreasing concentrations of hydrilla going across the spectrum. So we've got a little work to do on this. It's not ready to be sold as a handy little test, like a pH strip or something yet, particularly because as you can see, it's tricky to really tell unless they're all stacked up next to each other, whether the colors differ, et cetera. You can envision the challenges. But it's something we're working on in, a, in a, an interesting project focused on hydrilla presence. So the real message, um, again, with this uh, section is that it really is possible to detect plants using eDNA, which up until really just a few years ago, was a little bit of an unknown. It hadn't been tried much um, and needed to be studied more. It's safe now to say it's possible and it's useful in some scenarios where um, the seasonality is right. So seasonality is important to think about as is, again, kind of the ecology of eDNA in that particular system. Flowing water, stagnant water, the types of organisms being detected and what we might know about its ability to shed little bits and fragments whether it's, again, emergent or just near the bottom and unlikely to be seen, et cetera. But it is possible and, and does seem useful in some scenarios. So this gets us through these three different sections. And again, some of this has been a little high level, but I hope it has given you a useful introduction really into some of the methods, a few of the details of how samples are collected, filtered, processed in the lab uh, to determine species or specimen presence in a particular sample. Some of the history and pros and cons, advantages of using eDNA in different scenarios. And then a confirmation really that it does work for plants. And this is hydrilla example in particular is a promising one that we're continuing to work on um, and that um, could be a useful application. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Mark for now. I've seen a few questions come in. I can't see the chat at the moment, but I'll look forward to conversation in the question and answer section. Um, and feel free to keep in touch really to I'll put, yeah, here we go, my email address up here too. Um, and you can feel free to reach out anytime. Paul, that was amazing. Um, and so while you take your slides down and Mark gets set up, um, uh, it was a a great introduction to how does it work, some of those images about all the steps in the process, just perfect. And it's really hard to give a presentation because you don't know who's out there listening and watching, but I could see faces in rapt attention and there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat. So we've got lots of questions um, after Mark's presentation, but you know, contamination from voters, is there temporal information? Can you tell if the infestation was here 10 years ago or six months ago? People are ready to go out and have it for plants. And I mean, I, I want that, you know, pH test strip, but we need to know right. where we can use it yet. And uh, also some people are wondering if they want to start, where can they find some labs? So a couple of good questions in there, and we'll get to the Q&A after we hear some really exciting stuff about this with HWA as well. I am going to post something in the chat right now, which is that our partners over at the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario PRISM are starting a new citizen science effort with an eDNA testing process along the St. Lawrence. So I'm going to just hit the link to that. There's a uh, citizen science training starts next week. So please take a chance to look at that too. 
All right, and now I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and it's really great to hear how this might be, this new technology might be useful for Hemlock Willia Delta too. Take it away, Mark. All right. There we go. There. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thanks. Wow, from 3,000 miles away, it's amazing what technology can do. Yeah, there is some advantages uh, <laughs> of Zoom and not being able to be in person. Phew, but, but uh, yeah, we're glad you, we could have you. Yeah, this, you know, this past year has really been an eye-opener in many respects. Uh, one of them is our capacity to use Zoom um, and actually me being able to learn it. Uh, but anyway, uh, Paul, thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, introduction uh, to eDNA. And um, I got to say, your lab is just does amazing stuff. Uh, um, and uh, just as, a, as an aside, I, I was introduced to eDNA in a really meaningful way. Actually, David Lodge's uh, office is only 100 meters from my place, but um, I was at a meeting in Saratoga Springs and he gave a talk on uh, uh, the uh, CARP. And all of a sudden the lights went off in my mind and I immediately accosted him after the meeting and we had lunch together. And uh, he said, oh yes, I've been meaning to talk to you about the Hemlock Willia Delgin. And so that was my, my real introduction. And um, I am, I'm going in with both feet now. Uh, our initial field season last year, uh, uh, was just remarkable in my mind. I'm going to discuss some of that. But uh, first of all, uh, let me just sort of talk about the bugs so everybody's on the same page with what we're doing. Let's see. There we go. Um, so this this is the Hamlock Willia Adelgid, and I put it up there just so you can realize it's really not a very complex looking thing. It has mouth parts that are much longer than that. And you know, basically it's just a balloon that uh, puts its mouth parts into the twig tissue, the xylem, and uh, uh, feeds on actually the storage cells that subtend the uh, growing xylem in the twigs. So it doesn't feed on the needles, it feeds on the twigs. Um, this is what it looks like uh, when it goes Actually, probably a lot of places this year. It's been a heavy, uh, heavy. Uh, um, let me put it this way: it was the most mild winter I've ever seen in our sampling of wintering mortality for hemlock woolly adelgid populations this year. Are going berserk, uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, I haven't seen it uh, really go as rampant in this uh, in my in my uh, whole career studying this insect. Um, but anyway, uh, this is uh, a map of the origins of Hemlock Willia Delta. There are actually five areas where it's native, two in Japan, in Japan, two in China, and the Pacific Northwest. It's a native insect. That's why I'm here now, uh, because the native insects tend to collect a lot of predators, and that's why I'm collecting the predators for our biocontrol program. The HWA on the East Coast was probably introduced in the early 1900s uh, when Japanese gardens were all the rage uh, in the Richmond, Virginia area um, on nursery stock. So it came from Southern Japan. Uh, um, and uh, why we don't have the Western Pacific Northwest biotype uh, out East is still one of those mysteries to me. Uh, but anyway, suffice to say we have it. This is the life cycle, a very complex life cycle. I'm not going to dwell on it. Basically, there's seven uh, distinct adult forms of this insect. Uh, but the important thing is here in the, in, actually in the Pacific Northwest and in the East Coast, it's only an asexual life cycle. It's a very abbreviated part of it. Um, basically, two generations a year, if you start in the summertime with the crawlers settling on the new expanding twig tissue, they look like this all summer long. Uh, very small and uh, inedible to predators, which is uh, an advantage if you're a tiny bug. If you're nice and fat, you're liable to be eaten, but if you're a tiny speck like that, you're less liable. Um, then in the wintertime, and usually in October, November, they begin to grow. In December, you really see a lot of the waxy wool produced from the dorsal surface of the insect. Um, and then um, in springtime, uh, the, the adults begin to lay their eggs. March, it all depends on temperature. Um, the eggs hatch and you get the second, the progridians generation. So it's a systems generation most of the year through the summer and the winter and the progridians is a short spate in the uh, 
in, in springtime. And usually by the middle of June, all the eggs have been laid and the crawlers for the systems generation are settling. Um, so this is just a, a way to look at it. On um, the twig here you have in September, the young little black ones are settled on the uh, last year's twigs. Um, as the season goes, they put on more wool. Uh, the wool uh, becomes very dense, especially when the progridians eggs are laid, and they settle amongst their mothers, which is a very interesting thing. Uh, and so it's a, there's a lot of density dependent uh, uh, relations going on here with mortality events. I'm not gonna get into that right now. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, daughters from the progridians generation then settle on the newly uh, uh, expanding twigs. Um, in the beginning of summer. So that's just a stylized life cycle of this insect. Um, here, the impact on the trees, though, is something that it's important to understand. First of all, the, the uh, hemlock woolly delta inserts its mouth parts into the twigs, usually near the base of the needles, because at the base of the needles in the xylem tissue, the woody tissue here, that's where there's a proliferation of the cells that they feed on, which is the, are the xylem ray parenchyma. But if you look at this photo right here, it's these little, these little radiated uh, lines right here are the xylem ray parenchyma. And so what happens is basically when they feed the, the hormones that they inject into the tissue, which is, I guess, to simply say, it's sort of like they're fattening up the tissue. They're making those cells uh, produce more food for them to eat. Um, in the process of doing that, it clogs the conductive tissue and thereby it indirectly kills the buds first because the buds are expanding and they have great demands for water and nutrients. Uh, and if they can't get that, they will die. So the buds die, but the needles actually are retained for a very long period of time and really show very little evidence of any decline unless you're looking at the buds. Um, it usually takes four, 10 years. I've seen trees last 20 years, but they don't look very good. Um, so what are the management strategies? Uh, and I'm sorry if anybody got on the seminar expecting me to get into management because I'm not going to. I'm gonna talk more about eDNA and biological control. But basically systemic insecticides are very effective. Uh, and uh, we've been using them in the state and actually all over the East Coast for many years to save priority scenic uh, and ecologically important individuals and stands and help slow the spread into areas that might be threatened. But really the long-term solution in my mind, and the reason I'm out west is because I think the predators, it's important to get predators and for established for biological control. Um, that really is the long-term solution. And it really is a system that you know, my observations here in the Pacific Northwest where it's a native insect, I see predators driving the system much more so than resistance, but that's not saying that tree resistance isn't involved, uh, but I do see biological control as being very important. Um, so what are the management issues that we're facing um, and why is eDNA so important? Uh, first of all, early detection of incipient infestations is just critical for allowing uh, management options, and this is this is what happened at Lake George uh, last summer when we got uh, the incipient infestation detected by a camper. And subsequent survey found it to be spread much further than I was hoping. But if we hadn't detected that last year and we detected it maybe next year, it would be a totally different story because of the, the mild winter and the population expansion that we had. Um, but also the, uh, when you're working with biological control, uh, the detection of predator establishment and spread is absolutely key to be able to adapt your techniques uh, uh, to attain uh, effective implementation of the biocontrol program. And that's where really the eDNA, I think, is really important uh, in our program. Uh, Paul, I really liked your slide earlier talking about invasions and uh, establishment of the, the sequence. I found this paper recently that equated uh, classic biological control with uh, invasive species. And it's just, it fits perfectly. The problems are the same. Well, not a problem. It's a problem if you're trying to do biocontrol. Uh, it's a, a, hold it. Anyway, the problem is trying to get them established where with invasive species, the problem is when they do become established. Um, so, uh, when we're looking at establishing the biocontrols, right now we're working on 
uh, basically three different insects, two silver flies here in the later in the Progridians generation and the Laracobius beetles um, over the summertime. So these basically three predators are the most common and highly specific predators on the West Coast. Um, so what are we doing for our eDNA project? Basically, we're trying to develop species-specific uh, assays for HWA and the predators, and we're also looking to determine the correlation between the eDNA signal and the population density uh, using active sampling uh, in the forest canopy. Developing a novel eDNA capture method using passive samplers, uh, which is uh, test, yeah. and uh, distinguishing predator species in other experiments. This is something we just sort of stumbled on, and I'll describe that. But then also, I think one of the biggest prizes is detection of incipient HWA infestations using eDNA. So basically, uh, these are the, these are the uh, predators that we're working with, the silver fly and the Laracobius beetle. Um, so we got the uh, P QPCR essays uh, developed for the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, both the western and eastern biotypes. Uh, the assays for the um, adelgid were, was important that we uh, consider all other adelgid species present uh, in the environment. So we tested all these other adelgids. Um, it's interesting to note that only two of them are native, Pineus strobi and Pineus pinifolii. Uh, the others are actually introduced as is the hemlock woolly adelgid. And the balsam woolly adelgid is a big problem right now in the Adirondacks as well. Um, so we got very good results when we tested these markers uh, on the uh, insects with material from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, when we basically grabbed foliage on the Pacific Northwest, brought it back to the lab, we did the eDNA test on it, and we also did uh, uh, dissection, manual dissection under dissecting scope, which is very laborious, um, and uh, the DNA just proved us that even where we did not detect the organisms present on the samples, we did find their DNA, um, which shows, the, uh, points out the sensitivity uh, that Paul mentioned earlier. Um, then we also uh, wanted to correlate uh, the eDNA signal with population density uh, using active sampling of, of the foliage as we did in the earlier test um, and comparing that with uh, manual uh, uh, evaluation of the tissues under a dissecting scope. And then comes Del Island. Uh, last summer, uh, everybody remembers the, the uh, fun we had on Lake George. And um, we, uh, Dome Island is a beautiful island in the middle of the lake. It's actually surrounded by water, which is a system that's very unique uh, in, in my mind. Um, I was invited to go out uh, by the Lake George Land Conservancy and, and survey for HWA. We got our crew together. Um, it's just, it was, a, it was a beautiful place to do field work. And I quickly realized um, that it was an amazing uh, research uh, uh, possibility because here it is, it's a contained system. I've never really had the opportunity to watch how uh, hemlock woolly adelgid moves across the landscape because really you can, it's really hard to, to uh, exclude immigration uh, into a system. Uh, so we got Dome Island and we split it into 16 different quadrants uh, along the north-south axis. And we decided to sample one tree in each one of these quadrants. And the reason why only one tree, well, basically when we landed on the island the first time, uh, it wasn't more than 15 minutes, and I hear Alex in the distance yelling, uh, wow, we found it. And it was all of a sudden, it's like, dang, uh, I was really not looking forward to that. But our experience uh, in other parts of, of, of uh, Lake George, where he'd actually climbed some trees, was that um, the HWA is not always present on the bottom of the tree, but it can be at the top. And so at the south end of the island, where we found it, there was one big, huge tree that was sitting there. It was, it was full of HWA. It was, in my mind, it was like a sail. It just caught these uh, uh, propagules uh, sailing into the island. And then in my mind, it also was spreading from that point. So we wanted to see what does it look like when you have these different trees all on the island? How can we look at the way the population spread? Um, so we sampled by climbing the trees and sampling the three different layers uh, in each of the trees. But then we also did a, uh, a 
a survey around the edge of the island using this very tricky boat that uh, DEC has rigged up for servicing the campgrounds around the lake. It really was the only way to do the sampling around the, uh, around the periphery of the island. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was also a pain. Um, so this is, this is what we found we, by looking uh, at all the samples that we got um, under the dissecting microscope. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the big the trees we climbed at the south end of the island. We found a lot of uh, HWA on those. We found some on the uh, shoreline survey as well at the south end. Um, and we weren't really, we didn't really know what to expect on the north end, uh, but then we got one at the north end as well. Um, so what we did is we started our sampling in the trees at the north end because we figured there was less up there and contamination is a huge issue. Uh, with eDNA work, we were very careful to use gla uh, gloves with each sample collection that were then discarded. It seemed like a big waste, but the information generated was amazing. Um, the sterile technique, I just can't say enough about how important that is. I was actually, I screwed up once and I, uh, I, I consider myself like when I'm doing survey for HWA, sort of like uh, pig pen in the peanuts uh, comment strip. After a while, I feel like I got uh, clouds of uh, HWA DNA just just bouncing all over me. And sure enough, I did a sample collection without being very careful in a place that I knew that there wasn't any HWA um, and there was HWA DNA on it. So I went back with sterile technique and sampled and of course it wasn't there. So I learned very quickly how important uh, contamination is. Um, so what we did is we but then we took the samples that we collected from the trees. We didn't have enough uh, wherewithal to do the, all the samples around the, uh, around the edge of the island. But when we looked at the uh, samples from the trees, this is what we got. So we start here um, at the north end of the island, A1 is, uh, and then B1, and then all the way to the south end of the island here. So by visual detection, we found only 23% of the samples to have uh, HWA on them. Here is that one tree at the very north end, it was towards the base of the tree. Uh, there's another at the base here, this one found only at the top of the tree. Um, and then we found here at the south end, uh, there were a lot of HWA. Um, but then if you look at the genetic, the eDNA that we got from these samples, we got 92% of the samples with eDNA. Um, some of those were uh, 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 way too low to quantify the amount of eDNA in them, but some of them had huge, uh, 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 huge amounts of eDNA. Um, if you look just at a couple of these here at the south end, uh, tree number B7, um, it had uh, B, uh, tree number B7-2 um, is the original huge tree that had uh, the uh, HWA on it. B7-1 is nearby. Here you can see it was, it was six, almost seven per centimeter at the base, five per centimeter in mid-crown, and uh, one ten, uh, 0.017 per centimeter at the top of the tree. If you look at the eDNA signal there, uh, at the top, it's it's very low, but it is also much higher in the middle and and actually at the base as well. But if you go to the north end of the island here, try try tree A three. A three had none on it that were detected with looking at it through the dissecting scope. But then we got huge amounts at the top uh, and the mid and even at the lower part with the eDNA. So this was really interesting to me. It really demonstrated the sensitivity of the technique uh, for detecting uh, hemopoly adelgid. Um, this is another way to look at it. We got the, uh, on the left is the, uh, uh, the visual ob uh, um, observation of the tissue of the samples and on the right is the eDNA. So um, basically, um, I just, right now, uh, I look at it as a really important part of our toolkit, and I just can't wait to get into some of the areas where we're doing biocontrol. Um, another one of the things that we've been thinking about, um, uh, uh, the grad student I had working on this 
Anish Kutain uh, developed this, he had this idea of using, collecting rainwater and running it through a carbon, activated carbon uh, filter so that we could collect the DNA over time. Um, and this is something that we're going to be looking at uh, because uh, further, um, because it really would be handy just to put out a number of these in an area and perhaps delimit uh, um, uh, HWA, but also delimit and, and record over time the expansion of predator populations through an infestation of HWA. Um, another aspect of this is the uh, these bugs, these flies are just so dang similar. Um, and it's really difficult when you get them plastered in sticky traps like we are doing uh, in British Columbia with colleagues at the uh, CFIA. Uh, we're looking at to see if what traps work for trapping them, but also to see when they're active, just to see, because they're actually, you know, you don't think about flies as being long lived. We had them living for up to a month or more uh, in the lab. And does that really happen in the wild? I don't know. Um, but when we get them caught on these sticky traps, they're really hard to identify the species, but species, two species in an area, they have to some way separate the resource. And so we're looking at that resource separation uh, partitioning and you've got to identify them. We used eDNA to the rescue to identify them off these sticky traps. It's really remarkable. Um, and then lastly, I think, uh, can we use eDNA to detect incipient HWA infestations? I, I think it's possible. It's We have to actively sample foliage. Uh, we have to be very careful. That's the problem. The contamination thing is really, really important. Um, and, you know, my lesson was, was very well learned. Um, and, but we can sample foliage, but I'm also wondering, could we sample bodies of water? Uh, perhaps uh, when DEC is doing their sampling uh, for um, of, of aquatic systems for other things, we could get a sample. And maybe if we get something, we could work upstream and maybe find uh, the source of these uh, infestations. Plus, we could also put out passive sampling stations if that actually pans out over time. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, and, uh, and if you want any more information on our program, there's our website, the NYS Hemlock Initiative. Uh, uh, please, you know, and please feel free to go there to ask us any questions that you might have. Um, and I can't help myself. I have to do this. So anyway, <laughs> um, there's my there's my email address if you want to ask me a question. So. I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for uh, for ending your presentation on a little bit of a humorous note. Uh, Mark, it is just so great to see some of the data that you're getting uh, out of Dome Island. It is a little depressing to find that the north part of the island is also has some contamination which is uh, what we had not hoped for, but the eDNA and your tissue sampling has been a really great way to give us some more information about that. Um, Mark, if you stop sharing there, it'd be great, perfect. Um, and Mark, I also love the way that you, uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the Spock slide, but I love the way you ended the presentation, which is thinking about the future power of this tool. I mean, there may be down the road the ability to combine multiple sampling from multiple things um, in our aquatic and terrestrial ecosystem. I know there's a lot of interest in questions on this call, and I do want to remind folks that this is pretty nascent technology. There's been a lot of body of work gathered on fish, but a lot of what Paul was talking about with some of the aquatic invasive plants and the stuff Mark is talking about in terms of terrestrial ecosystems is really cutting edge and brand new. So we're gonna maybe start from the top with a couple of questions. Um, Mark, you gave a great discussion, example of how contamination can work. And Paul, we had a question coming out of the Lake George watershed and it was related to the hydrilla work. So if you've got lots of boats coming in from other places and they might have a little bit of hydrilla on them, but there's no hydrilla yet established in Lake George. Is the eDNA sampling probably going to pick up that hydrilla? Yeah, that's a good question. It's at least worth thinking about, I guess I would say. Um, if there were bits of the plants on boats and the sample was taken right around the boat launch with a lot of those 
um, uh, craft going in and out at the same time? I would say it could, yeah. Um, but I think also, um, maybe this will get two questions at once. I think um, there's a question too about the time frame. And really, the, the time frame of detection is more on the magnitude of days to weeks rather than, say, months to years. So if you've got a bunch of boats going in on a weekend that have potentially little bits of hydrilla on them, and then you sample a couple of weeks later after it's been pretty quiet, especially if the if the lake if there's been wind and the water's moved around quite a bit, I guess I predict probably you wouldn't detect it. Um, so definitely a chance and definitely worth being conscious of, I think. But but not a not a factor that would um, be a problem for a bigger scale use of the method, I think. Right, and that's an interesting thing about the timing of the sampling. And I don't know, Mark, if you've given any thought to that, but um, how long do you think the adelgid would be of the eDNA would persist? So let's say we have been very successful in our application of dinopecuron on some of those trees on, uh, on Dome Island. And allegedly, or let's say we've been successful, and that, that one treatment has managed to eliminate the adelgid from that particular tree. We still going to see the eDNA? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> More than no, thank you. That's, a, uh, that's you know, that, that, is a, that is one of the first questions we started asking ourselves. And we have uh, experiments designed uh, that we're going to be working on this year just to see about not only the HWA, but also the persistence of the uh, predator DNA. And of course, there's going to be some environmental uh, uh, constraints on the uh, DNA uh, degradation rate. Um, so it's it's not a, a simple answer uh, to your question, but it's an important one. And uh, next year at this time, we might have some more information for you. Great. Maybe just one other one other yeah. quick thought on there too. I think at least with the aquatic work, um, it is worth being conscious of situations where, say, the sediment's been really stirred up after a storm, um, and those types of scenarios could result in detecting something that was there. A year ago, or it's basically like doing a sediment core and then resuspending all that material into the water column. So you could detect things that were there a while ago in that scenario, um, but that you're basically not sampling the water. In that case, you're sampling the, the benthos or, or material that was there a while ago. Um, and, and one other thought is that, the, again, most of the particles are like bits of cells or bits of tissue. And one way we actually sterilize some of our material is putting it under UV light. So if, if a surface has been out in the open for a while, especially on a bright summer day for 12 hours or something, there's, there's a number of methods that the DNA and the tissue can really break down pretty fast too. So be conscious of when like things are resuspended, but also it breaks down relatively quickly if it's out in nature and um, getting exposed to, to light in particular. Okay. It seems like we've got a couple of groupings of questions. I'm going to throw one at Paul and then one at Mark. And the, the one for Paul is, you know, sort of what can we detect today? And the one for Mark is where else can we detect it? So, but for Paul, um, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in aquatic invasives, uh, particularly our plants here at APIP. We are keeping track of 11 target species, kind of half plants and half small bodied organisms. Um, so, can we pick up a jar of water today and go through the sampling and find all 11 of those species? Do we have the markers for that yet? Kind of where are we at in terms of being able to identify the most common suite of invasives, particularly plants here in the Adirondacks? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, I suppose the short answer would be that there's a good chance most of those could be detected in a, in a sample. Um, there are varying um, costs associated with, say, sampling and focusing on just one species in the sample versus trying to focus on everything in the sample. Um, and, and one thing we've been working on with some of the other prisms, I think I see Brittany on this call, maybe others mm -hmm. too, is, is kind of an in-between method, which we're still, we're kind of just getting back in the lab trying to perfect this, but a method that would focus on a suite of 
priority species um, and be a little bit lower cost than just focusing on one or everything. Um, so the meta barcoding approach that I method that I mentioned would probably be able to detect everything on that list potentially, um, but it costs a little more than focusing on a per species um, level. So, so the technology is being developed, and I think in general um, there's a lot of genetic data out there, um, and there's a lot of progress that's been made on the methods. So. But I guess as, as you think about that too, I suppose the pieces to be conscious of are, are really um, having background databases of genetic information about those species. Um, so just physical samples that have been sequenced. So we know that the genetic makeup of those species. And then secondly, the primers, the genetic material that, that we use to make lots of copies of the, of the um, genetic material. So those are the two real pieces that need to be developed um, if a new species is, is of interest. Yeah, that's super helpful because I'm not sure that all that, um, that there's been the analysis yet to figure out what the markers are for some of the species we're looking at. And that's what's so cool about what's been happening in Mark's lab is like yeah. trying to figure out what are the markers. So Mark, people want to know, are we going to be able to find this in rainwater? Are we going to be able to look up at leaf litter? Are you know, other than getting tissue samples of live plants, are we going to be able to extend the use of this? Well, I, you know, I think a lot of that goes back to the original question that you asked, what is the persistence of the DNA in the environment? And if you're picking it up off the ground, it, you know, it, it probably isn't very fresh. I'd look more to uh, material that's on on twigs of hemlocks. Um, so I don't know though. I mean, it's something that we can test, but we only have so much time to test that. And I'm just I'm going for the low hanging fruit first. Uh, the the rainwater uh, and streams that's that's a long shot. I don't know. You know, the dilution factors. This is more of a question for Paul almost. You know, can you get a little bug, an infested tree, in a in a creek watershed actually detectable uh, in a river, you know, miles downstream. Uh, my initial feeling is like, I doubt it, but as you get closer, the chances probably increase, um, but we haven't tested anything like that yet. Um, so there's a lot to do. There's more questions that we have that you, know, you just keep thinking about them all the time. And that's, it's good to have questions because then you ask them, well, which ones do we need to answer first? Um, so, yeah, we're, to, we're at the very beginning of this, but I just look at it as just an amazing tool uh, in, my, in the system that my lab works in. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting to watch where this goes. Um, I think the next sort of questions are somewhat about readiness and where you could go to have samples analyzed. So, Paul, I think particularly in the water world, um, if people were out, let's say we have a lot of folks are our volunteers on Spoon Lake, they wanted to get involved in this, they wanted to get some samples. Um, where do they send it to? What does it cost? And then I think there was another question that was related for Mark, um, which is how close is this to being able to have a place where you could you know, send a sample in and have it analyzed? So Paul, to you first. Are there commercial labs out there where people can send samples to? And is it so, you know, is it is possible to afford it? <laughs> right. <clears throat> Short answer, yes. <laughs> um, and, and it's really developing quickly. Um, the, the costs are always tricky because there's there are differences in costs um, depending on the number of species of interest. Um, sometimes we kind of quote, I think there were some. Um, individuals we were talking with not long ago who were quoting some um, specimen costs, I want to say per sample of around $100 a sample, but that, that goes up and down depending on, again, the number of species of interest. Um, the, the commercial options are, are kind of constantly growing. Um, there are university labs that process samples for a given cost, um, including some at the Cornell Vet School um, and other other universities too. Our lab isn't doing that at the moment, mostly because it's tricky to balance the research with kind of on a uh, service, fee for service, whatever sort of model. Um, but there are others that are. Um, there's also a number of companies out there, uh, including even some 
I don't know if folks are familiar, like in the fisheries world, Smith Root produces lots of sampling for wet sampling tools and stuff. They have now a backpack eDNA device. I don't know the cost of it. It's pretty pricey, I think, that you can go around and kind of almost like a metal detector. <laughs> um, I don't think it has the ability to, to light up if something's in the water right now. It's mostly like a pump and a filter sort of thing. But there's a lot of inventive um, entrepreneurs putting together material out there. Um, the one thing I would say too is that Again, it just requires some, some thought and some communication if it's done on a, on a more of a personal or citizen science level, um, because obviously, especially a detection of a, of a species that's um, going to have a lot of management implications um, is, is influential. So again, like given the Asian carp example, if someone had just gone out to the Chicago River and detected Asian carp using their homemade kit and and then called up the local TV station and said, I found Asian carp. And they hadn't told any management agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers and all this sort of thing. That would have caused a whole cascade of challenges. <laughs> so, so that's worth thinking about, especially as the technology becomes more available. The contamination issue, like Mark emphasized, is real. Um, and it's possible that especially on a local level, and not local, but if we're just doing it in a backyard sort of way, Contamination can be an issue that's hard to track down, and you don't want to be advertising that I found an Asian carp in um, whatever Tiro Pond or something, and and not have the ability to really say whether that's a real signal or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. There's lots of hope out there, lots of possibilities, lots of precautions. And Mark, a little bit. Uh, I mean, there was a question, which is, you know, how close are you uh, are you to having this available to uh, for land managers? I'm going to. Assume that's a bit of ways away, but oh yeah, I mean Paul brought up, I mean, I think the the big the gorilla in the closet. It's like the information that's developed is just so huge, uh, with hemlock woolly adelgid uh, and and of course Asian carp. Um, that you know, right now uh, it's I, I I wouldn't trust a lot of the if somebody else was doing the work, I wouldn't trust it. I would ask the question too, because of the contamination issues um, right now, and it's it's just research right now. It's that's all we can afford. We only have the the resources uh, uh, for research, and you know if there's important research questions to be asked, like you know the invasion front on the south part of the Adirondacks, for example. You know if we could design an experiment uh, that we could actually track that uh, uh, in a detailed manner, that would that would be very worthy. Um, and I'd love to do that, but you know, for for landowners, maybe in the southern uh, Catskills or whatever, where HWA has been around for a while, uh, that's that's a that's really not a, um, a good use of our resources at this time. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, and to Paul and Mark, um, thank you both for amazing presentations today. Just really great. So glad that all of our partners could hear from you. Um, and thank you for your work. You really will be changing the landscape for what we can be finding for uh, invasive species. So thank you for that. And uh, I'm going to just circle back to where Carolyn Sear started uh, earlier this morning, which was saying that hope comes from action. And so it's been an amazing morning and there is a lot of hope for our Adirondack region. Lots of people out there taking great action, lots of ways to get involved this summer. Um, so thanks to everyone for offering a lot of hope for this region. And so I'm gonna close off, we'll stay on and answer more questions if people have them, we'll stay on a bit, but we'll close the formal presentation and let you go off and look for some signs of spring. Anybody who wants to have a few questions answered those, welcome to stay on for a few minutes.